You're listening to Summer in the School of Faith, a sermon series about discovering the foundations of our faith. For more information about First Baptist Startville, please visit www.fbcstartville.com. We've always wanted to do. We finally got to make it to Colorado. And if you've never been to Colorado, let me just tell you, prepare. It's one of the most beautiful states in the nation but we were just overwhelmed by the rocky mountains in particular we were overwhelmed by all the wildlife and we were there for a particular conference and uh, this conference had us staying at this house that was uh, just an immaculate house I mean you're literally riding through this neighborhood and there are streams on either side mountain streams I mean we're riding by some of these immaculate houses that movie stars live in and I don't know how we found this house but I'm so grateful that we were able to get it but we stayed in this house and uh, we, we sat down at the breakfast table, and we looked to our left, and there was this huge window, and right outside there was a little creek that fed into a pond, and then right in the distance was this mountain. And we were just like, man, can you believe that we're here? This is incredible. I mean, you know, we're looking up real estate prices and trying to, this would be a great place to have vacation, something like that. Well, we went to bed that night, and we woke up the next morning, and the mountain that was there just outside our window, we couldn't see it. It had disappeared because snow came in during the night and it blanketed the whole area. Such a thick covering of snow that we couldn't see the mountain. And as we're looking outside, ooing and awing, because all of us are from the south, you know, down in this part, so we've never seen that much snow, much less that much snow in November. And we're oohing and awing, and we look and we see that there's these little footprints on the lake or the pond that had frozen over. And so we're following the footprints, and here's a fox, a little red fox walking. And then by the time we see the fox, we look, and there's this huge elk right in, in the front yard of this property. His name is Buddy, but anyway, that's a different story. And then as we're looking at this big elk, we notice, and here comes a bald eagle that just decides that he's going to fly by. And I think, my goodness, where are we? This is a picturesque, perfect moment. Never seen all three of these animals at one time before. And so we went out later that afternoon, and we were riding around, and we stopped because there was a whole herd of elk on the golf course eating the green. And uh, we stopped, and we were asking, having a conversation with one of the locals. And I asked this lady, and that's how I find out the elk was named Buddy, by the way, but anyway, I asked the lady, I said, do you ever get over living up here? And she looked sort of puzzled, like she didn't understand what I was asking. And she finally said, you know, yeah, we love it up here. But I could tell just by her reaction that the same feelings that I had were not mutual with her. The feelings that I had of just being overwhelmed by so much wildlife, she did not share those experience, that, uh, that reaction with me. And I think I know the reason. The reason is maybe at one point she had those feelings. Maybe that's why she decided to move from wherever she was and move to Colorado. Maybe at one point she had those feelings, but the newness sort of faded away. The, awe in, the inspiration of aweness that she had sort of was not as sharp as mine was in the moment. It was sort of dulled. And I got to thinking about that as it relates to our common Christian experience. If we're not careful, the same thing can happen to us. Because here we sit Sunday after Sunday, and we hear a message from the Bible. We, number one, we forget the fact that it's a treasure that we even get to have the Word of God. It's a privilege that we get to come together in a setting like this where we get to freely exercise our right, God-given right, to worship. We forget the fact that the single message that we have is this awe-inspiring message that Jesus has paid it all, and all to him you owe. You see, I'm afraid that oftentimes if we're not careful, we can be so close to the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the fact that through Jesus Christ you are accepted. The fact that because of what Christ has done on the cross, you are forgiven. Because of what Christ has done for you, you are free. You now get to be included in the plan that he has before the ages began to include you in an eternity with him forever. We can get so close to that message. Well, we just take it for granted. And so what I want to do today in particular in this series, is I want to in, in this sermon, is I want to encourage you to cling tightly to the cross. 
Because there are temptations that you will face. There are temptations that I will face as a pastor in leading a congregation like this to not stay tethered to the cross, to let other things take a priority, maybe in the way that I preach or uh, the, the message that I proclaim. Other things can take priority. Maybe that's politics. Maybe politics takes your priority. Or maybe it's certain personalities and, or different ideologies that are just coming at us left and right. Far be it from me, far be it from us that we should ever stay, that we should ever cease to cling from the cross. Far be it from us that we should stay untethered from the cross. And instead, we must stay close to the cross. The reason I think that's so important is in particular as it relates to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. Go with me, if you wouldn't mind, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. When Paul's talking to this church in 1 Corinthians, they're a church that's filled full of different personalities. They're saying, you know what, I really prefer this preacher over this preacher. Maybe, maybe I like Paul better than I like uh, Peter. Or maybe I like Peter better than I like Apollos. And Paul then has this church that is so concerned with everything else other than what matters most. And listen to what Paul says. Listen to the way that he reacts to their sentiments. He says this in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 1. Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, listen to this language, lest the cross be made empty of its power. For the message of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Now listen close. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discerning of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who's wise? Where's the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world didn't know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews, a folly to Gentiles. Look at this language. But to those who are called, or that is, to those who are being saved, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God chose, look at this language, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let no one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And I want to ask you a question this morning as we get started in in this sermon. Is that, can you say that of yourself? Can you honestly say with singularity, this is my one primary boast. I have one confident point to boast in all of my life. And that one confident boast that you have is right here, the cross of Christ. Now, of course, what we're doing there in this series in the summer is we're looking at the Apostles' Creed. And I'm trying to introduce this way of for us to start thinking as a church. That is, in the Apostles' Creed, we have our common Christian confession. This is what all Christians through the ages share in common. Now, a lot of Christians say more than the Apostles' Creed. For example, as Baptists, we have something called the Baptist Faith and Message, and the confessional doctrine of this church is the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. Well, we say more than the Apostles' Creed, but if we're going to be Christian, we can't say anything less than the Apostles' Creed. And it's providential today, it's providential today that the section of our creed that we're looking at is this section that says that he was crucified, died, and he was buried. So where are we since we're attempting to ground everything that we know 
about our common Christian confession in the Old Testament, the question that I had in my study was where are we going to go to ground the idea of the crucifixion from the Old Testament? And here's where I went in my study, and I want to take you now. Psalm 22. Would you take your Bibles, please, and join me in Psalm 22. The reason we look at Psalm 22 is because Jesus, when he's crucified on the cross in Matthew in particular, he has a certain saying. And in that saying, he says, he quotes exactly from the beginning of Psalm 22. Now, he's doing that with purpose. He's doing that to say that everything that we see in Psalm 22 is now being fulfilled in this moment. What's he say from the cross? The first line of Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so what I want to do in this sermon, in particular, since we have this idea that Paul says to the Corinthians, he said, you know what? There may be better preachers than me, but nobody has a better message than me. There may be better preachers than me, but nobody has a better message than me. What I want us to do is I want us as a church to commit to saying that we will cling to the cross. And what I want to do is I want to walk us through Psalm 22 And I want to give you five reasons from Psalm 22 to cling tightly to the cross of Jesus Christ. And the first one is right there in the beginning for us, right from the first few verses here. We cling tightly to the cross of Christ because, number one, it's the only way that we can be accepted by God. The cross of Jesus Christ is the only way that you and I can come to the knowledge of God. It's the only way that we can know who God is. Think about this for just a minute. You cannot know God except from a cross. What does that automatically tell us about who God is and what it means for us to serve Him? We cannot know God apart from a cross because the cross tells us that if there was another way of salvation, God would have done it. If there was another way for you and I to go to heaven when we die, If there was another way for us to be accepted by God, then in the wisdom of God, surely he would have done it. But the reality is, is the cross is the way that you and I, it's the only way that we can be accepted by God. And the reason that we're accepted by God is because of exactly what happened at the cross. Jesus quoted Psalm 22, and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know what that means? It's not abandonment. There's no idea that Jesus is abandoned at the cross. That's not what happens. It means that for us, as we're going to look at in just a minute, Jesus entered into our separation. He entered into our forsakenness. He entered into the, us being far from God so that he could bring us close to God. He says, why have you forsaken me? He says, look at verse 2. Oh, my God, I cry, but you don't answer. In other words, he has this experience that he he feels this experience that you and I feel. Maybe we feel it and we don't realize it. Maybe our hearts are so hard that we don't recognize the fact that we are far from God. But there are so many individuals that are walking around all amongst us in our society in Starkville that they don't know God. They are forsaken. And the reason that they're forsaken is because that they were born in sin. They were born in sin separate from God, and they continue walking therein. They continue walking in what it means for them to be separated. So, for example, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter, chapter 59, it says it plainly that sin is what makes a separation between us and God. Listen to Isaiah 59 and verse 2. Your sin have made a separation between you and God. This is the whole message of Isaiah. The whole message of Isaiah is that here are these individuals who they think that everything's all right. They have this idea of what it means to have success. They have this idea of what it means to to have human flourishing. But they've left God out of the picture. They've left him completely out of the picture. And as a result, they are separated from God. Iniquities make us separated from God. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ has done for us. He has taken the separation. He has taken the iniquity. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that he made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we could be the righteousness of God. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5.21. Listen to this language. 
for our sake, not because of something that he needed. There again, don't get this idea of God that, you know, he, he had this, this worship meter that was sort of going down and he's looking around saying, who's going to worship me? After all, don't I deserve it? Who's going to worship me? After all, this is who I am and what I, that's not what happened. The Bible says, for our sake. You know what that means? And here's the audacity of the gospel. Jesus Christ thought of you. And he willingly took the curse that, that, was, rightfully, that was rightfully yours. He willingly underwent the penalty that was for you. He underwent a death, not of his own, not of his own sin, but he took our sins upon himself. And he was willing to take that curse. He was willing to feel the forsakenness that all of us feel so that we could be made the righteousness of God. The Bible says, for our sake, listen to this, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin. Don't miss that. The reason that he's qualified to be a sufficient Savior is because he didn't have any sin of his own. But he had my sin. He had your sin and the sins of the entire world. He made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The reason why we must cling so tightly to the cross is because only through the cross are we accepted by God. It's because he has felt the forsakenness that was rightly ours. He had no griefs of his own, but he had every grief of ours. He had no sin of his own. Instead, he is able to take the sin that we had upon himself. And as Colossians says, disarm the powers and principalities by nailing every written ordinance as it was against us every time that we had that thought, every time that we acted on that thought, every sin that we did in secret, every sin that we did that someone knew about it, every sin that we did, he took upon himself so that he could then give us a righteousness. He took, listen to this, he took our sin so that he could give us his righteousness. He didn't have any sin. We didn't have any righteousness. There was a great need that we both had that he then gave what we could not we could not gain. He gave us his righteousness, and he took our sin. We cling to the cross, number two, because when we cling to the cross, we are demonstrating that we are trusting in God. Look at verse 6. We demonstrate that we trust in God when we cling to the cross. Verse 6 says, I am a worm, not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people, all who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. Look at this language. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Because of 2 Corinthians 5, 21, I want to tell you something. I hope you're listening. Because he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that we could be the righteousness of God. Listen to me. Because of Jesus Christ, there is not one thing you can do to make God love you anymore. And there's not one thing you can do to make him love you any less. Now, that's audacious. No, I think audacious is not a better term, I li or not a good term. I like Wilberforce's term a lot better. It's not audacious. It's amazing. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Because of what Christ has accomplished. And this is why we have to cling to the cross because automatically you're going to try to justify, well, here's the reason I'm accepted by God. I'm accepted by God because I come to First Baptist Church in Starkville, Mississippi. 
I'm accepted by God because, listen, I take care of my mama. I take care of my grandmother. I, I pay my tithe. I do this. I do that. There's not one thing you can do to make God love you any more than he does. And there's not one thing you can do to, that can make him love you any less. Because Jesus Christ has willingly given his life for you. This is the reason, for example, Paul, when we come to Romans chapter 5, he preaches grace so strongly that he has to follow it up by saying, what shall we say then? Shall we sin that grace may abound? And he says, never. May it never be. And some of you say to me, you say, you know what, if you keep preaching this message of God loves, there's nothing we can do to make God love us anymore or love us any less. If you keep telling us that, then we're going to go end up just thinking that we can sin all that we want to. And I want to tell you something. If you understand grace, you can sin all that you want to. You just won't want to. You won't want to. Because the love of God compels you. The love of God constrains you. Because if you truly know the amazingness of grace, that God loves you, not based upon what you can do, should do, might do, or could do, but because of everything that God has done. Once you've tasted and you've seen that the Lord is good, nothing else will satisfy you other than Jesus Christ. Are you trusting this morning? Ask yourself. And this is why, for example, Jerry Bridges in his book, The Gospel for Real Life, says you need this Every day, not just the one time you take the aisle and take the preacher's hand. You need to preach the gospel to yourself every day because you don't believe it. It's hard to believe that no matter what you do, God accepts you. He knew what you were going to do and he still willingly chose to go to the cross for you. And there's not one thing you can do to make him love you anymore. There's not one thing you can do to make him love you any less. You need this message, not just for the first time, but for all time. As J.D. Greer tells his church in North Carolina, the gospel is not simply the, the diving board where we jump off. It's the pool that we swim in. We need this gospel truth because you'll be tempted, believer, to go far from the cross. You'll be tempted, believer, to start self-justifying instead of saying, you know what, I trust in Christ and I trust in Christ alone. Look at verse 12, for example. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. You know what that's a reference to? That's a reference back to Isaiah, I believe, is chapter 2. These uh, bulls of Bashan, this is this attitude and this disposition that God resists. It says it clearly in James chapter 4 that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You're saved not because you deserve it, not because you can earn it. You are saved because of what Christ has accomplished for you. And I'm just telling you because I know I've, I've done this long enough. I've pastored enough people. I've lived long enough in my own Christian experience. Given the chance, you will neglect this message. Given the chance, you will begin to self-justify and say, this is why God loves me. Because of what I do or what I don't do. Or you'll get sidetracked. And instead of preaching the message of the cross, you'll start dealing with the symptoms of our sin-sick society. And you'll make that your message. Instead of preaching the cure, Instead of preaching the remedy, you'll go and you'll focus on other things. But listen, we have to cling tightly to the cross of Jesus Christ because this is our common Christian confession and this is the one message that we have to preach to the world. The third reason we must cling tightly to the cross is because the cross reminds us just how much it is that God loves us. When we see the cross, we see two things. We see first, we see what it cost, what, uh, what the consequences of our sin were. The reason why we look at the cross and we see a bloodied Savior, the reason we see that is we're to be reminded of just how much sin cost. And we're also supposed to be reminded of the next point, that even knowing the cost, Jesus paid it all. Knowing the cost, Jesus paid it all. Look, for example, in chapter 14. Look at the gruesomeness of the crucifixion that's crucified here. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. 
My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaw. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Jesus, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You remember why he died? He didn't die for his own sin. He died for you. Anytime you broke God's law, past, present, or future, anytime, Jesus felt it all. Jesus, knowing what it was going to cost, the Bible says in Revelation that he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You know what that means? It means that in some mysterious way that I can't even begin to comprehend, the cross was the plan all along so that God could demonstrate how much he loves us, so that God could come to you right where you are, you who are riddled with guilt, you who can't believe that all you have to do is have faith in Jesus. You mean all I have to do is place my faith in Jesus and I can be born again? All I have to do is place my faith in Jesus. He paid it all for me. I don't have to do it. No. All you have to do is believe. What's the Bible say? This is a summary of the gospel. You know it. John 3, 16. God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever does this and that, that whosoever comes to church, that whosoever reads their Bible, that whosoever doesn't do this, does it say that? Whosoever does what? Say it louder. Believe. Believe. And what's the result of that? What happens when you believe? You'll have everlasting life. It's so simple. But we oftentimes make it so complicated. The reason why we make it so complicated, listen to me, is because within us there is this temptation to self-justify. There is this temptation to not trust in what God says. There is this temptation to rest upon what we can do, thinking that we might deserve it, we might could earn it, if I just do just a little bit more. But we can't do anything like what Jesus Christ has willingly done for us. The fourth reason, or the first reason to cling to the cross is at verse 22, the cross of Christ is the theme of our praise. Now, I want you to see this. I want you to see this. Notice where we start. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when we end the psalm, when Psalm 22 ends, which is a picture of the cross, which is a picture of the crucifixion, notice the way the psalm ends. The psalm ends with praise. You see, this is the single message of our praise. This is the singular banner that Christians through the ages walk under. And this is also the point at which we continually have to remind ourselves, don't get off centered. The whole house of Christianity is built on an old rugged cross. Don't miss that. The whole house is fit together by two cross beams that have been tied together by a sinless Savior who gave his life so that you could be with him forever. Look at what he says in verse 22. I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised, look at this, he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Remember, forsaken doesn't mean abandoned. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard him when he cried to him. From you comes my praise. You want to praise the Lord this morning? 
You want to know what it means to have a life that's filled with joy and satisfaction and hope and have every one of your longings fulfilled? Cling to the cross. Cling to the cross. Have your life tethered to the cross. Yes, it's, it's folly for those who are perishing. People may misrepresent you. They may not understand you. But to those who are being saved, it's the wisdom of God. And it is the theme of our praise. But I want to tell you something. It's not simply the theme of our praise. Listen to me, number five. It's the theme of their praise too. It's not only the theme of our praise. It's the theme of the others out there that need this too. They just don't know it yet. Because there's no way to be right with God. There's no other way to have your sins forgiven other than through the message of the old rugged cross. And eternity, listen to me church, eternity depends on us getting this message right. Look at what the Bible says. Let me show you this. Verse 27. All the ends of the earth shall remember, and they shall turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. Kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over all the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. That's Philippians 2, by the way. Every knee shall bow. Even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. Look at this language. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. He has done it. What's the message that we have, church? Not just do a little more. Not just do a little better. Not you clean up your life and then come to Jesus. That's not the message. As audacious as it is, what's the message? What's the message we tell to the next generation? He has done it. Jesus has paid it all. And all you have to do is by faith Come to him just as you are. Agree with him that your sin deserves punishment. But Jesus has taken the curse for you. He has undergone the penalty of your sin that your sin rightly deserved. Jesus has done it. And our message is not clean up your life and then come to Jesus. Our message is Jesus has done it all. Like an old preacher used to say on the radio, Jesus says, hey, you catch them and I'll clean them. Don't you worry about it. I'll make sure they all get all right. Our message is Jesus paid it all. And let me just say, you'll miss this. You'll get tempted to go out and talk about the symptoms of our society instead of the cure. You'll get tempted to go out and make it your hobby horse and your soapbox to talk about symptoms, symptoms, symptoms. I don't want to preach symptoms. You want symptoms? Go out to the self-help check in, at section of whatever bookstore. There you can know all about the symptoms. I want to preach the cure. And his name is Jesus. Let me tell you a story that I don't think I've ever told publicly. The Lord taught me very early on in the first church that I pastored what it means to cling to the cross. We were undergoing a season of growth. I was plowing in the field there at that little country church after just leaving ministry at First Baptist Atlanta where we would go and we would have, you know, 5,000 people on a Sunday and ministry was going and you really felt the impact of really making a difference. Well, the Lord called me to a church in North Carolina that the sanctuary would barely hold 90 people and on Sundays we'd have about 45 usually, so about half full. And finally, we were starting to make some progress. We could see the gospel bearing fruit. People were being saved. We were going to add to our staff. We'd already added a part-time music minister. We're fixing to add a 
children's minister. We're fixing to add a youth minister. And all of a sudden, right when we're fixing to have this growth and momentum, one of the, one of the senior ladies in the church, she got her feelings hurt. And to make a long story short, she ended up running everybody that I had just hired off. Three years of plowing, fixing to reach a moment. And the three new hires that I was fixing to make had all in one instance been ran off. Sunday after that happened, I went down into my study on Monday. And I was writing my message I was going to come back next Sunday and I was going to tell the church what a bunch of stiff-necked, hard-hearted, hindrance to the gospel progress people that they were. And I was, the message that I was going to share. And I got down on my knees and I said, Lord, I need help here. I need to make this clear. I need power from on high. You know, I'm, I'm going like an Old Testament prophet. I need power from on high to make this clear. And it's just like the Lord said to me, not an audible voice, but it was louder than audible. He said, you go ahead and you tell them what you need to tell them. But before you tell them anything, you better be willing to die for them. Because that's what I did. And with integrity, I couldn't stand before that church. I couldn't share the message that I thought was on my heart. Why? Because I was not clinging to the cross. There's a remedy for this world. There's a cure for all. And it's Jesus Christ. And our message to the world is that while we were still sinners, not because we had everything figured out, not because of what we could do, should do, might do, or could do. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Our message to the next generation, to the people yet unborn, listen, Jesus Christ has done it. Startville needs to make sure that First Baptist gets this right. Don't deviate. Don't get off track. Cling to the cross. Amen? Amen? Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the way that you love us. Thankful, Lord God, that you've given us a message. Thank you that Jesus has come, made an end of our sin. Thank you that Jesus has done it. Father, it's my prayer that everyone within the sound of my voice would realize this, that they would search their heart and the part where they're not trusting in Christ alone, would they place that under, their, under your obedience right now? And may you feel joy. May you fill this place with joy because we together as a church say Jesus has paid it all. Help First Baptist Church in Starkville, Mississippi to cling to the cross. And everybody said, Amen.